You're listening to Southern Fried Sports with Travis Ryer on Tide 100.9 in Tuscaloosa. TUG HD2 Northport and W265CG Tuscaloosa. Tide 100.9 and streaming on the Tide 100.9 app. A Town Square Media Station. This is Southern Fried Sports with Bama Online Senior Analyst Travis Ryer on your home for Alabama sports. Tide 100.9 and streaming on the Tide 100.9 app. Senior analyst for BamaOnline.com. Of course, that's a part of the 247sports.com network. I'm with you, though. Weekday mornings from 11 a.m. until noon. The show, as always, brought to you by Peter Brook Chocolatier at 1530 McFarland Boulevard North in the Indian Hills section of Tuscaloosa. Peter Brook closing in on its 15th anniversary there in Titletown. And none of that possible, of course, without the great people, the great customers who frequent the premises on a daily basis. And speaking of a daily basis, today a great day to get by Peterbrook because you got got Father's Day coming coming up. And you don't want to miss out on this one-of-a-kind chocolate experience that Peterbrook is offering right now leading up to Father's Day. Your precious kiddos can go to Peterbrook and create their own handprints in chocolate for Pops coming up on Sunday. That's right, handprints for Dad. You can do that today, as a matter of fact. Between noon and 2 p.m., they have a window set up today at Peterbrook Chocolates here. Get those handprints for Dad. In chocolate. Edible. He'll love it. No No reservation required, by the way. You can give the store a call. At 205-752-0211 for more information. Joined on the program by the executive producer of Southern Fried Sports, Jacob Harrison. And together, we combine to form the 60 minute Woo! of Sports Talk Radio. Jacob, how are you doing on this hump day morning? I'm doing all right. I'm, I'm highly anticipating uh, that I get plenty of chocolate this uh, this Father's Day after all these Peter Brook reads. Yeah, I hope you get uh, I hope you get the handprints, man. Those are really really cool. It's uh, it's like a white chocolate handprint into a milk chocolate frame, and all of it, all of it, you can consume. Jacob doesn't get much better than that. By the way, thanks to Jacob filling in the last couple of days here on the program. I had to go into the shop for a little bit. You know, I'm kind of like one of those Bavarian made sports cars. When I'm out and running, I look great. You know, I look great on the autobahn when I'm out there tooling around, speeding around. But like those Bavarian-made automobiles from time to time, had to spend a little time in the shop. And usually when those cars go in the shop, it's a little pricey, a little pricey for the maintenance. That's kind of kind of like yours truly, but we're glad to be back, glad to get into a lot of sports talk with you today on the program, 205-342-9904. That is the Peterbrook Chocolatier Studio Line. If you'd like to jump on board with us, we'll have Cecil Hurt, sports editor, columnist, extraordinaire for the Tuscaloosa News and Tidesports.com. We'll jump in with Cecil coming up in just a little bit. Go through a myriad, a myriad of topics with Cecil. Got some bad news on the men's basketball front while he's away, right? James Rojas, the veteran forward, second time in his stint at Alabama, going into his third year in the program. An ACL injury for James Rojas. We'll talk to Cecil about that. What we'll Cecil about where he thinks we're headed for, say, the upcoming football season in the way of media accessibility in sports, with an emphasis on the upcoming 
football season. Maybe we'll get into some Deontay Wilder, Tyson Fury press conference talk. I'm not sure if you saw that yesterday. Deontay took the headphones approach, had the headphones on the whole time, didn't answer questions. Deontay, all business in advance of Wilder Fury 3. And I'm going to ask Cecil if you could pick one NBA player to build a team around just for next season, just for 2021, 2022, who you got? And that comes on the heels of just another performance for all time by Kevin Durant last night in the Brooklyn Nets game five win over the Milwaukee Bucks. How about 49 points, 17 rebounds, 10 assists. Kevin Durant played every minute of that game last night, and he needed to because you got Harden lipping around with the hamstring, not 100%. Kyrie Irving now with the ankle injury. So Kevin Durant, is he the best player in the world right now? If you had to pick one player for next season to start a team with, would it be Kevin Durant? It'd be hard for me to turn away. From a 6'10 guy who can bring the ball up, can beat you off the dribble, can post you up, can shoot the three, you name it. Kevin Durant is that in a basketball player. Some other NBA news from this morning as well. Stan Van Gundy uh, didn't really get to know you all that well down in NOLA. Stan Van Gundy, after just one season with the Pelicans, out as the head coach. So here we go. Zion Williamson going into year three down in the Crescent City. He'll be playing for his third head coach. He got a lot of movement on the coaching front in the NBA. A lot of injury news. A lot of COVID news now in the NBA, as we found out this morning. You had the Athletic first to report that Chris Paul, the all-NBA guard for the Phoenix Suns, has entered COVID-19 health and safety protocols and will be sidelined for an indefinite period of time. So we'll see how that impacts the Suns, who made light work, made quick work of the Denver Nuggets in one of those Western Conference semifinal series. But you're hoping now, if you're a Suns fan, that this Jazz Clippers series can kind of go to seven, go the distance, game five of that one, and... Uh, You get the news uh, that Kawhi Leonard this morning, coming from various outlets, Kawhi Leonard, the outstanding guard wing for the L.A. Clippers, uh, likely out for tonight, maybe the entirety of the the, the remainder of the playoffs for the L.A. Clippers. So a big blow to the Clips. Uh, So injuries this morning we're hearing a lot about, kind of overshadows again that historic performance by Kevin Durant in Game 6 of the Eastern Conference Semifinals last night up in the Gotham area. 205-342-9904. Um, you got the, uh, you got the, the, the mandatory mini camps, as we used to call them. I guess they're called OTAs now, you know, things like that in the NFL. See, we're two or through five picks. Uh, in the uh, workouts, the mandatory OTA down in South Florida yesterday. Now, look, there were some contributing factors. Apparently, you had a monsoon in play. Uh, but, you know, you don't really worry with two as much about the hand size thing. Because remember going into the combine, one of the real positives for Tua, who was obviously dealing with the after effects of the hip injury, sustained late in the 2019 Alabama football season, was that... In, in comparison to other quarterbacks who have passed through the combine since its inception, Tua was like a top 20, top 25 guy in terms of hand size. But I think what really was in play in reading some of the coverage in the aftermath that uh, Brian Flores is adamant that Tua take more chances with the football. He's got to show he has that ability that the Dolphins and several other folks, myself included, believed he would be able to do and that's fit the ball in tight spots so an emphasis on the workout yesterday for the Miami Dolphins was that Tua needed to take some shots take a few chances here and there and it showed up in the form along uh, with the monsoon five interceptions I think that's a good thing for Tua because I thought too often as a rookie and understandably so and also understanding he didn't exactly He didn't exactly have his 2018 weaponry around him from Alabama down in Miami last season. Uh, He's got to start having enough confidence in himself to to make those kind of throws. Um, I never thought I'd say that about Tua Tonga Bailoa, by the way. I thought, if anything, Tua going in the league was a guy you might have to dial back a little bit. 
But the Dolphins are, again, Brian Forrest, the rest of the franchise down there, they're adamant. They want to see that Tua that has that ability to get the ball into some windows. And so that's what the Dolphins were working on yesterday. And uh, Tua, to his credit in the aftermath, didn't make a lot of excuses, didn't make any excuses. Said, i got to be smarter in some situations. And at the same time, i got to continue to try to be aggressive. We're going to step aside for our first break when we come back. It is awards. It is preseason watch list season that we're going into now. Uh, I think we can uh, safely assume at this point. We'll talk about that. And then we'll be joined by Cecil Hurd of the Tuscaloosa News and TideSports.com when Southern Fried Sports returns on, on a Wednesday right after this. Alabama football countdown clock is driven by Crawford Insurance, Tuscaloosa's low-cost auto insurer. Call 752-6489 for a free quote today. Roll time! Roll time! There are, there are, there are 80 days until Alabama football. When you think about businesses that are selling through the roof, like Aloe or Allbirds or Skims, sure, you think about a great product, a cool brand, and brilliant marketing. But an often overlooked secret is actually the businesses behind the business, making selling simple. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. Nobody does selling better than Shopify, home of the number one checkout on the planet. And the not-so-secret secret with ShopPay that boosts conversions up to 50%, meaning way less carts going abandoned and way more sales going. So if you're into growing your business, your commerce platform better be ready to sell whatever your customers are scrolling or strolling on the web, in your store, in their feed, and everywhere in between. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout Skims uses. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash try to upgrade your selling today. Shopify.com slash try. Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. Lots of sunshine this afternoon. The high today, 89. Clear tonight with the low at 63. Tomorrow and Friday, partly to mostly sunny both days. Highs between 86. And 90. Saturday, clouds move in, a chance of rain by afternoon, the high 84. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 82 degrees in Tuscaloosa. Tide 100.9. For more coverage of Alabama football, visit us at Tide100.9.com or download the free Tide 100.9 app. The Crimson Tide will not be denied. <laughs> Roll up in the club. All eyes on me. All eyes on me. You know what? A little Tupac. You got it you don't know on what would have been his 50th birthday like today. Ready for the fuck, but I don't think they know one the only. Tupac Shakur. That song right there, the younger brother, was such a problem on the pristine banks of the St. John's River as a high schooler at the Bowl School. Coming over from the west side. His senior quote at the illustrious, prestigious Bowl School was all eyes on me. How about that for a senior quote at the Bowl School? Tupac Shakur would have been 50 today. 205 342 9904. It is a Wednesday edition of Southern Fried Sports. Cecil Hurt coming up in the very next segment. Um, we were talking about how it is officially, Jacob. I guess we can go ahead and say it's officially college football awards watch list season. That's where we're at, it feels like. Uh, and when you look at this Alabama team for 2021, Jacob. Let's run down some awards list likely candidates. The Doak Walker Award, which annually goes to the top running back in college football. Got to be Brian Robinson, right? Uh, <laughs> I, I, For I'm, Alabama now. Yeah. I'm not saying he's going to win it. I'm right. saying he's going to be on the preseason list. On the preseason list, probably, yeah, sure, because uh, – I think maybe the, the nation might not understand how, how stacked this running back room is, but I wouldn't be shocked by end of season. We're talking a lot more about Trey Sanders or, or Roy Dell Williams, somebody like that. Yeah, Jace McClellan uh, in that mix as well. Definitely a loaded situation, but we're talking preseason watch list. Blitnikoff, uh, top receiver 
in college football. Pretty obvious that one. John Mechie, he's going to be on a lot of lists, probably even some early Heisman Trophy lists. But Blitnikoff, the most uh, realistic, I would say, for John Mechie in year three of his time with the Alabama Crimson Tide. Outland Trophy, Evan Neal, I would think. What about uh, Bryce Young? How many awards lists will Bryce Young show up on? Is he going to be the most prolific preseason watch list guy for Alabama, Jacob, you think? It's got to be him I because quarterbacks are eligible for so many awards. If, if it wasn't for that, I'd say Evan Neal or Christian Harris or Will Anderson. But, I mean, he's going to be eligible for so many rewards, and he benefits from all the turnover at quarterback from, from all the other top uh, programs in the country. And look at just the last two first-year starters for Alabama at quarterback in terms of Heisman finalists with Tua tonga right, 2018, Mac, 2020. Even Jalen Hurts was the SEC Offensive Player of the Year as a first-year starter back in 2016. So you're right. The light shines bright on the quarterback position, and there are more of these honors Uh, to be tied to if you play the quarterback position. You mentioned Christian Harris, boy. The Buckus Award, how many from Alabama? How many Alabama linebackers on this Buckus Award watch list? I got to think Harris, obviously. Will Anderson's a linebacker. Um, You got the Hendricks Award for kind of the edge guys, too. Uh, Henry Toa Toa now in that mix. Christopher Allen, a linebacker. Um Gosh, at least two, right? At least two of these guys on the Buckus preseason list. I got to think. I don't know how you don't put all four, honestly. Oh, I, listen, <laughs> you're, you're, I'm telling you what I think the list will do. Now, for me, yeah, I, I would – Harris, Anderson, and Toa Toa, to me, should be the three. And then, Allen, you could make a case for, for sure, in terms of a fourth guy on that Buckus list. Uh, the Thorpe Award, Josh Job, the corner – I think that's a safe assumption. And I would say Jordan Battle as well. Um, The Thorpe tends to go to corners, but it is the top defensive back in all of college football. So I would think Jordan Battle would make that list. What about you, Jacob? Well, there was that one year that they gave it to that kid out of LSU who didn't deserve it, but you know. Uh, oh. But uh, I, I got to say Malachi Moore. Uh, I, I know he's that that safety, mm-hmm. you know, hybrid nickel corner or whatever uh but but he's turned heads just as just as well as will anderson has i wouldn't be surprised to see him on some preseason list and i guess some of it has to do with who alabama chooses to submit for some of these lists i think some of these lists just go on their own and so if that's the case and the thorpe goes that way and i would think alabama would would push uh malachi it's just that malachi hadn't really done much since about the 11th game of last season. He had the injury and then sat out the college football playoff. Didn't really see him in spring practice. But just based on what he did last year, absolutely. I think Malachi Moore is a guy you could push for that as well. How about Will Reichard for the Lou Groza Award as the nation's top place kicker? Am I jinxing him, Jake, by mentioning Will Reichard for the Lou Groza? I'm still Alabama trying. fans are touchy about that. They're touchy about that, you know. I'm still trying to just pretend 8 day didn't happen. <laughs> to be honest. It was a trip to the driving range. Like I've said before, Jacob, he was just screwing around on the driving range, trying to hit a few different shots, you know, and uh, yeah, I- I'm with you. I don't think 8 day was maybe indicative. Look, he's not going to make every kick in his Alabama career, but uh, a two for five sort of, sort of took some Alabama fans like Jacob back to their, their dark place. Did it take you back there a little bit, Jacob, that spring game performance? I mean, you know, Alabama fans are used yeah. to, to living in that dark place, so it was nice to get out for a little <laughs> while. No, I've, I've got confidence, and I agree with you. Uh, oh. He's probably just working on a different motion or something because everybody in the press box was saying he hadn't missed anything up until that point. So who knows what that was all about, but there's a oh, lot of good I kickers out there. I don't really believe that. I don't really believe that. I'm just, I'm just saying it to try to calm some folks down. I think he just missed. But, yeah, that's what I'm going to sell to a uh, very delicate, touchy fan base when it comes to the kickers. We got to keep that. We got to keep it uh, tapped down as best we can. Remington Award for the nation's top center. I would think Chris Owens. 
would be on that uh, preseason list. Uh, the offensive line award, the Joe Moore award for the top offensive line uh, in college football, Alabama, the defending the trophy holder as it sits right now. And then the Heisman Trophy, we mentioned this, Mechie, Bryce Young, more so at the top of that list. What about Will Anderson, though, if he goes totally nuts at outside linebacker? I'm not saying he's going to win the award, but if Will Anderson takes it to a whole nother level in year two, I don't think it's all that far-fetched to think we could hear Will Anderson thrown around a little bit at some point during the season. Let's go to the Peterbrook Chocolatier studio line right now, and let's check in with Steve on a Wednesday. Steve, how you doing? Jim and Ryan, how are you doing, bud? I'm good, man. Hey. As long as we're naming names, dropping names, tell me, and because I have lost complete track, where are we on punters? Oh gosh, you've uh, you brought in the the uh, the Australian punter now uh, over the weekend. Uh, gosh, the uh, James, it was it James? I got to I got to pull the name up, but uh, James who who has come in and who has left? Yeah, you've got – I don't believe you have Charlie Scott anymore. He punted what, for you last what ha- year. What happened to him? I, I guess that's really why I'm – You know, he still, he, still had a, he still had an Air Force commitment. You know, he came in from the Air Force Academy. Oh, Charlie you Scott know what? Did. I didn't even know that. Yeah, so you've added Jack Martin, who we've had on the program in the last few weeks, the transfer from yeah. Troy. Uh, yeah, now yeah, you add yeah. James Burnip, who will be eligible this season for the Crimson Tide, previously committed to Ole Miss – uh, you know, it was a matter of time. You know, I sort of railed against the, the Australian invasion where the punting jobs were concerned in American tackle football, but it's just too much to overcome. You knew at some point Nick was going to bring in one of the Aussie punters. And so here's James Burnett. And in all seriousness, if he's something like what a lot of these guys have been from down under, maybe Alabama will have its true successor finally to J.K. Scott. Well, I, I hope so. I, to me, there's just too many things that can go wrong with an Australian punter. I assume he does, you know, runs back and forth behind the line of scrimmage trying to figure out where to kick it, depending on what well, leg I think, I, you know, there's this, uh, there's this, uh, there's this base, it's basically an agency over in Australia. I think it's Pro Kick is the name of it. And it's Australian based. And that's what they're doing right now is, uh, is, is feeding programs uh, in the United States with punters. And there's a lot of them are former rugby players, Australian rules players, uh, and they convert them into punters. And the track record's pretty good, Steve, uh, with with a lot of these guys. They've come over and made a a big impact at the college level, and you've seen quite a few in the National Football League. So I don't think it's slowing down anytime soon. Well, I guess I'm just very, very spoiled from, from J.K., he was uh, yeah. he was a tremendous talent, and yes, he and, was, and, that, and an absolute travesty that he was never uh, he never won the Ray Guy Award. Yeah, yeah, I think there were two years and probably some Aussie influence in keeping him out of that. If I go back and look at the list um, of winners, J.K.'s freshman year, he should have yeah. won it. Um, two thousand and sixteen, excuse me, two thousand fourteen. He was just tremendous right out the gates and yeah, probably he, he was, maybe his junior year. And then even as a senior, he was asked to do some place kicking as well and yeah. did some of that. And just a uh, hell of a career for J.K. Scott. Hey, Steve, we got to get to this break. Thanks All right, for the Travis, call, I always. appreciate your time, bud. There he goes. Steve checking in on a Wednesday. Going to step aside to this break. When we come back, Cecil Hurd of the Tuscaloosa News and Tidesports.com right after this. Bye. You're listening to Southern Fried Sports with BamaOnline.com senior analyst Travis Ryer on your home for Alabama sports. Tide 100.9 and streaming on the Tide 100.9 app. You all appreciate it. When I was young, me and my mama had beef 17 years old, kicked out on the street. Go back at the time, I never thought I'd see a face. Ain't a woman alive that could take my mama's place. Spend it from school, I'm scared to go home. I was a fool with the big boys breaking all the rules. 
shed tears with my baby sister. Over the years, we was bored and other little kids. And even though we had different daddies, the same drama when things went wrong, we blamed mama. I reminisce on the stress I caused. It was hell, hugging on my mama from a jail cell. And who thinking elementary? Hey, sports. Right here on side 100.9 FM, Travis Ryer, senior analyst for BamaOnline.com with you weekdays, 11 a.m. until noon. And on Wednesdays at this time, we like to check in with Cecil Hurt, sports editor, columnist extraordinaire for the Tuscaloosa News and TideSports.com. Cecil, as we bring you on here, an amazing athletic calendar year for the University of Alabama, I guess culminated with track and field here in the last week or so. Um, and so I wanted to ask you where this program, this department sits in the director cup standings and, uh, the, the postseason presence that the university of Alabama and the athletics, uh, in general had during the 2020, 2021 athletic calendar year, the sustainability of that Cecil, do you think this thing is set up to replicate that kind of success on an annual basis? Um, I do. I, I don't know that they're going to fill it up somewhere once the track, and they did well enough in women's track to uh, help themselves in that sport. So Alabama will be somewhere between 5 and 10. Um, they won't finish the calculations, for instance. <clears throat> Stanford, who usually right at the top is still playing baseball, So, um, for example. And um, – I don't know that, that you can say, oh, they're going to win the conference championships and and have deep NCAA runs. Um, football, you, you sort of anticipate that they will. But basketball, softball, women's track, uh, you know, the, the gymnastics, the, the sports that, that carry them, yeah, I think they're set up to be good. I think that they're set up to be good. It still leaves you with some that you want to see improve, obviously. Um, volleyball, soccer, uh, baseball, uh, making the NCAA tournament is is a step in the right direction in those terms. Uh, so I think that the, the sports that are the foundation of that, yeah, I think that they're, that they're um, set up to and if they have ongoing plans, you know, Greg Burns seems uh, intent on, on locking in coaches as he can. Certainly Nick Saban, Nate Oates, and I wouldn't be surprised if Patrick Murphy gets an extension. Um, so it, it's it's definitely, you know, the foundation is there. Now it's just a matter of, yeah, you, you get greedy, I suppose, if you're if you're an Alabama fan and you want those other other sports. You know, you'll be sitting there this weekend watching the College World Series and say, "Man, it's been a long time." You know, it's been twenty years, twenty one years uh, since since Alabama went to Omaha, and um, so they're ready for for that. Um, but particularly give. I mean, the football program generates a lot of revenue. The, being in the Southeastern Conference generates a lot of revenue. So for a, a school that's in a relatively small geographic area, um, not you know, it's not a Florida, it's not a Texas, um, yeah, I think Alabama's set up to, to continue to be um, competitive. It's hard to win it the way it's set up because uh, – the, the California schools, Stanford, and, and uh, so forth, they sponsor more sports and, and are, are not very good at, at a lot of them. So. Um, but top 10, I think top 10 every year is um, a high goal, and I think it's realistic. You mentioned one of the programs at Alabama that's set up for sustain, sustained success, the men's basketball program. Tough blow in the last few days with James Rojas going down with the second knee injury and his uh, entering his third year, I guess, at UA and in the program. And more, more than anything, just hate it for James Rojas. I mean, he's already dealt with this a couple of yeah. years ago. 
I, I don't think James was ever really a hundred percent last year, you know, from the, from the, uh, he had a wrist injury. He had, and, and we won't get into medical speculation, but you know, he had an undisclosed illness at a time that undisclosed illnesses were going around. Um, so the hustle was there. The, the, the will to compete was, was definitely there. And now he's got to go through, you know, he spent a lot more of his Alabama time in rehab than he has on the floor. Um, James had the decisive shot in the, the win at Mississippi state that clinched the conference, uh, you know, played hard nosed, played tough. Uh, Juwan Gary really developed and, and, you know, took some minutes in, in that role, but, you know, you just feel for James and, and I, and I think the coaches have, have oh, you know, he's had a, a long and close relationship with, uh, Brian Hodgson and Nate Oates. And, and so they weren't going to cut him loose or, or abandon James by any means. And if he wants to try and rehab, you know, from June to December and see if he can't get back in a, in a position where he can help the team, um, that's understandable. I mean, it's understandable that he'd want to give it, uh, that one more try. And as we said, as much as anything, you just you hate it for James Rojas. But when you look at this team moving forward, I guess it's built in a way to this point heading into year three under Nate Oates where it can it can overcome some injuries. Uh, when you look at more of the the, the complementary roles, the, the the rotational roles, and I think you touched on one of those guys that a lot of people are going to be expecting big things from that sort of fits that bill. And Jawan Gary, is, is he a guy that, terms of overcoming an injury of his own a couple of years ago uh maybe on the precipice of doing that and then a couple of newcomers and uh that could be in that mix yeah it's just going to be this the situation with the program under nate oaks i think you know and they're waiting to see uh after the the combine the, the nba combine is at the end of the month josh primo you know great for herb and and John Petty to both get invitations and seniors and guys who were um, finished with their career anyway. You know, the, the one that's the one to watch is clearly Primo. Um, I think Josh is probably we'll see how he performs at the combine. Um, you know, he, he may his decision may be: Am I going to be high second, lower first this year? Or can I come back and improve myself to lottery status next year? You know, Kyra made that decision and really improved himself. Um, so Josh is Josh is young, which which um, would, is the youngest player at the combine. Would probably be the youngest player in the draft. I don't know on all the Europeans that might be eligible, but the, the youngest collegiate player in the draft. So another year at Alabama to to develop could, could very easily put him into the lottery. Uh, but he might also say, you know, if I, if I feel confident, if I have assurances that I'm going to be in the first round, even if it's late in the first round, um, I have to do that. You know, I have to, for, for um, the financial stability for the family, if you're a first round pick. So uh, just wait and see. Um, just wait and see, you know, nobody, not even, not even Nick Saban, as he has famously pointed out before, has absolutely unlimited depth, you know, sooner or later, attrition takes a toll, but, you know, I think Alabama's pretty well set, we'll see what Jay, what Jaden Shackelford ends up doing, but, um, you know, I, th- I think they're pretty well set, and it will be a little bit different team. Uh, we'll, we'll not have guys who are identical to, to Herb or to John, which is just the nature of basketball. They, they seem really pleased with the newcomers, the guys that they got in the transfer portal, the, the, of course, um, the high school, two high school kids who are on campus, kids, not kids, young men, 
uh, JD and and Jaswan Jaswan Holt, and so um, you just want to keep enough. You want to keep the talent level and the intensity level and the buy-in level high. Um, a lot of SEC teams have really profited. It looks like from the from the transfer portal. So it's going to be tough to recognize some of the some some have it. some probably it's a negative for them like Georgia, but you know Kentucky will be a completely different Kentucky team than they were last year. Um, Mississippi State suddenly has, has really added some guys and that you know had some size coming back and some some talent coming back, and now it's added guys where you you think of them as a Contender, you know, you know, Arkansas is, is, I think Arkansas is just other than, you know, five star high school kids in the state of Arkansas, which there are occasionally some. Uh, I think they're just committed to doing most of their recruiting in the portal. And, you know, it's worked for Bill Musselman at Nevada. Uh, even when the transfer rules weren't as forgiving. So we'll see how that works for him. Um, I probably called him Bill. Eric Musselman, Bill. (laughs) I date myself. You know, Bill's Eric's dad. So, um, yeah, we'll see how that goes. And it makes sense. And and I wrote um, a few weeks ago, all of the sports are different. There's a – you don't have one and dones in football, but – you do have NFL early exits, but you know, at, at some point in the recruiting process, if I'm, if I feel like my good players are leaving, and you know, Ole Miss has gotten stung, I think a little bit, um, and I'm looking at a guy in the portal that's got two or three years left versus a high school kid. Well, if I take that guy in the portal, he doesn't have another transfer year. You know, he's He's pretty well committed. I mean, he can leave, but but um, much more difficult to have to do this sit out and so forth. But I, I don't know that um, – I, I wouldn't say you stop recruiting high school players, but I don't know that – you know, it wouldn't shock me to see uh, somebody use their 25 and somebody in the SEC, much less it's it, – in Conference USA or, or the American, uh, with 10 high school signees and 15 transfers. That wouldn't shock me next year. Help me out with this. Did the did the grad transfer go away with the one-time transfer, or is that still available? You That's can, still available. One-time transfer, so you still have the, I guess, the grad, the grad transfer trans- possibility. The grad transfer just eliminates the paperwork a little bit, you know. It's yeah. still there, right? So you got it's two hops, there. I guess. If you if you can access them at some point, it's a grad transfer. But again, um, you know, it's it's that's going to be a different situation, right? You're not going to get many of those. But yeah. you know, if I'm if I'm Mike Leach, you know, and do I, do I want to bring in 25 high school kids and have 10 or 15 of them transfer out? Or do I want to bring in some transfers and, you know, they're older, you know what you're getting. They may not be super five stars. You're not going to change. At the very top, at the very top, Alabama, Clemson, Georgia, LSU, Ohio State, you're not going to change the recruiting dynamic much at those places because they can go get that five-star high school players, four- and five-star high school players in sufficient numbers. But, you know, if I'm having to sit back and compete with them, you know, if I'm in the same division as them, um, you know, I, I might look um, at, at just how many high school kids I'm going to take uh, versus – when there when there are plenty of guys, when you know what you want, when you can be specific with with the position.
positions that you want. You can see how guys have played. In this case, you, you can see um, guys who aren't playing at Alabama, who aren't playing at Georgia, but you know what level they were in high school. And, and um, I'm going to look pretty heavily at those guys. Yeah, instead of raising the crops, you can go straight to the grocery store. Sure, exactly. Yeah, ready to go. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, and so, um, it, again, it's not that's not going to stop. Um, Ohio State, and Alabama, Clemson, and LSU from having top five recruiting classes. But it really changes. I think it's going to ultimately change the the total number of uh, scholarships that are available. And in, in the long range, you have to have the same number of players coming in. Um, you know, every year. They're, they're, that's not because because there have to be. High school guys who went somewhere who who become transfers, you know. But um, I don't know that those high school guys aren't going to be um, playing in the Sun Belt, the MAC, and and uh, you know you you want to avoid that farm system mentality. But I don't know that you're not going to see some of that. We talk a lot about fan accessibility in the midst or in the era of a pandemic and obviously how much it was impacted uh, last football season especially and we know now that many many programs many many universities plan to be full 100 percent capacity for the upcoming football season I'm interested though preseason mile markers like fan days I, I saw where an NFL team I think here in the last couple of days said you know training camp is usually pretty accessible to fans. Obviously not last year, but there was sort of this anticipation that that might return. But I know at least one NFL team said, no, we're not ready for that yet. What are you expecting, or is it still too early to say, like with Alabama and other places who like to have at least that one day in August where fans can come to a practice, get autographs, things like that? Or is that is that a possibility, you think, as early as August? Cecil, or do you think maybe we're still another year away from that type of scenario? I think it's a possibility, um, but I don't know that it's a, a likelihood at this point. Um, you know, there, there's there's a value to it, and it's a, it's a service to your fans. It's definitely a service to the media in terms of getting to see some guys. Um, <laughs> but but it's not a financial um, boom. It's not. It's not a. And and you know, if you do that in early August, there's a difference in that. And having the players and most of them are here. I, I appreciate that. But you know, another month of of people taking precautions and, and having the players in their, their um, routine, and so uh, I, I don't know that that decision has been one hundred percent made. Um, every every decision now is political. You know, if, if you do it, why are you doing it? If you don't do it, you know, why not? You know, this, this thing's over. Why not? You know, why aren't we doing it? So have to do, have to hash that out. <laughs> you know, I, I would. Uh, speaking as a media member, I'd certainly like to see a little bit of, of something beyond a day um, that we'll have to see. Yeah, maybe the open practice, but uh, you know, it, it may uh, who knows with autographs and things like that, and the uh, you know the, uh, the, the, the 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 nature of that. Um, we'll see how that goes. I was going to ask you too about media access um, for the upcoming season. I do you anticipate still in the way of teleconferencing mostly? Uh, uh, we've I'm seen very, some opening up, I guess you do, but do you think we're headed for that again in, in 2021? I do. I think once you've gone down that path and, and set up the parameters for that, I think it's probably um, easier for, for um 
universities to set those up than it is to have a to have an open you know in person interviews. I think there's a value to in person interviews that you don't get on Zoom. But um I, I think it may be hard to put that Zoom genie back in the bottle. Speaking of press conferences, did you catch Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury yesterday, Cecil? I did. Um, saw the replay of it. Didn't see it as it was going on. But, yeah, I did see uh, the highlights of that. Uh, interesting strategy from D. You know, <laughs> it, uh, um, and, and one that, that I thought was probably, you know, don't let – it, anything you can do to sort of take Tyson Fury out of his headspace. You know, I think he probably came in and was, you know, going to put on his usual show, which which he does, and um, probably wanted some back and forth, and some shouting, and some, uh, I'm going to call you a name, you're going to call me a name. Um, so I think he had to, to sort of regroup, it looked like, in the press conference. So, now, um, I also think that, that um, there, there's really, I mean, I understand the high value of selling the fight and so forth, uh, but there's really not much D can say. I mean, he's just got to go out and show it. You know, he's just got to mm-hmm. go out and perform. Um, you know, he may be able to be Fury, he may not, uh, but... I don't know what you say strategically before the fight anyway. You know, he, Deontay needs to be better than he was in the in the second fight. He, and if, if, yeah, in a certain way, in a long run, I don't know that Deontay's going to win in a 12-round decision on point. You know, Deontay's got to land that right hand. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, <laughs> he doesn't have to explain that to Tyson Fury or anybody else. So um, he probably, uh, and I read an article, this isn't an original thought with me. I was reading Michael Rosenthal last night, and he made he made a good point. Uh, Deontay probably talked too much after the earlier fight, and it sounded like he was making excuses. You know, his his Costume was too heavy, and, and, and you know, manager shouldn't have thrown in the towel with this, that, and the other. And it, he didn't come across well when he was talking a lot. So, so I think this is probably the best strategy for him going into the fight. Yeah, I was waiting on him to end up in Urban Meyer's office somehow, AEW <laughs> style. Yeah, but it just never materialized, Cecil. It didn't, you know, and and. It'll be fascinating. Like I say, it's a contrast in styles, and, and you watch A to watch Fury and see how how he approaches the fight, and B, you know, no matter what you think about D or, or how he fights or what he can do, uh, he's always got a chance. I mean, he's always got a chance um, if he can get that right hand over. You know, if he can get it um, like he did in the first fight. The, the remarkable thing of the first two fights to me remained Fury being able to get up and get a draw. So, yeah. um, so it, it's, I think it's always worth watching because even if you say, oh man, I'm going to bet on Fury, I'm going to, he's going to dominate, and he may do it. But you watch. You know, you watch for the for the explosion and a puncher's chance. That's where that came from. Yeah, and a big puncher's chance. You know, a big heavyweight yeah. world champion mm-hmm. puncher's chance. So, yep. and, and and not and and you know, D. That I mean, he's he, he's more accomplished than that. Now he's he still needs to to polish some things up and so forth. But I mean, he's not entirely just. A you know, you're not some right. You've seen fights where those there'll be, 
you know, some 250 pound schlub out there and people saying, oh, well, he's got a puncher's chance. Well, he does, but he doesn't. Um, but so, so D's better than that, but he has, I mean, D can put you out and, yeah, no uh, doubt. That's what to beat Tyson Fury is to do that. Hey, Cecil, as always, we appreciate the time, my man. Great stuff with you, and we always uh, look forward to it. Thanks, Cecil. Okay. Talk to you soon, Jeff. There you go. Cecil Hurt, longtime columnist, editor for the Tuscaloosa News and Tidesports.com. Always look forward to Cecil, the great Cecil Hurt. On Southern Fried Sports, back to put a wrap on a Wednesday edition of that right after this. Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. Lots of sunshine this afternoon. The high today, 89. Clear tonight with the low at 63. Tomorrow and Friday, partly to mostly sunny both days. Highs between 87 and 90. Saturday, clouds move in. A chance of rain by afternoon. The high, 84. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 83 degrees in Tuscaloosa. The flagship station for Alabama Crimson Tide football. Alabama touchdown. Only on Tide 100.9 and streaming on the Tide 100.9 app. James Harden playing hurt. Irving, Kyrie Irving with a ankle injury. Last game standing, maybe just the last player standing. Maybe that last player standing will be Kevin Durant. Boy, if you're Milwaukee or the Suns right now, for that matter, you got to think this is the golden opportunity to win an NBA title. That's going to do it for a Wednesday edition of Southern Fried Sports. Thanks to Cecil Hurst, longtime sports editor and columnist extraordinaire for the Test Sports News and TideSports.com joining us on the program. Thanks to Jacob Harrison for producing the show, the lunch whistle on this Wednesday. Southern Ale House, 1530 McFarland Boulevard North in the Indian Hill section. You know what is a good day? to go by Southern Ale House and get a Yardbird chicken sandwich. Any of them that end with Y, all right? That's the best day to go by Southern Ale House and try out that Yardbird chicken sandwich for yourself if you haven't done already. Trust me, it will be well worth your time and effort. Southern Ale House, 1530 McFarland Boulevard North. Until 11 a.m. on Thursday. Have a great rest of Wednesday, everybody. Come on.